But then we come to the next phase, which is the top. And the top of the phase is then the tightening of monetary policy. So I'm showing that, you know, um, in the next, the red boxes there. And you could see then interest rates rising and then interest rates, short term rates rising relative to longer term rates reflecting the tightening of the, of the uh, monetary policy. But also it shows the um, um, it, it changes incentives, because if you have a high cash rate relative to your bond yield or expected return, then why not hold cash? And when you don't hold cash, then you, what you're holding is uh, you're, you're taking money out of lending and you're holding cash instead of lending. And that has the effect of slowing things down. So that's the classic. And then we come to then the reaction, the dynamic, uh, which I'll call the depression phase. And in that depression phase, um, things start to change. That service payments become high because the interest rates went up and credit availability isn't much and you have a lot of debt. So they start to become squeezed and then behavior starts to change. Um, asset prices change because with tight money and higher interest rates, the prices of assets should go down. And, and you know, you raise interest rates and that means not only are those shorter interest rates competitive, but it means that the present value effect, in other words, the interest rate that you're discounting future cash flows with is then higher. So that means the present value of those assets goes down and you have that downward and then things start happening. So you have, entities that are now having problem paying their debt, the higher debt service and so on. Asset prices are falling. So those who bet on higher asset prices are now starting to lose money. And okay, they get squeezed. And then banks have problem, you know, the, the cash flows because not only um, if you have a situation where those assets are falling, but also you have perhaps people who move their money out of banks and that bank money's lent and so on. So you have a self-reinforcing downward cycle that has to be reversed by changes in policy. Okay, so then if it's, if it's not just a normal recession, a recession um, can normally be handled by um, uh, lower interest rates, increase uh, the availability of money and credit, and then things pick up. You know, it's almost like a central bank could hit a button and go and, the, and it reflates. Um, but if you have a structural problem like 2008, where you have zero interest rates, can't lower interest rates anymore and so on, then there are four main levers that you have to do to do a deleveraging or a restructure. And there are four paths and, uh, we see these four paths and we see in all these cycles, they go down the four paths. First, um, they go to austerity. They say, Ooh, we have too much debt. And because we have too much debt, what we have to do is cut the debt and cut the payment. But the problem is that one man's debts are another man's assets and, uh, you know, lending is required. And so you find that austerity doesn't work because even though it's true, you've got too much debt, the cutting back on the debt means the cutting back on expenditures. Well, um, so you, you start with austerity, but austerity doesn't work. And the second is defaults or restructuring. And the problem with defaults, as I say, is one man's debt is another man's assets. So when you write that down, you're taking assets off the individual's balance sheet or the bank's balance sheet. And as that, um, that all those assets were collateral for credit. And so when you reduce the value, people get broke and their entities get broke and that's not good enough. Um, then essentially there is uh, the printing of money to stop um, the bleeding and to, and to stimulate the economy. I would say the first two of these, I'm not saying they shouldn't be done. They should be done in balance. The first two of these austerity and debt restructuring are by their very nature deflationary, right? So they're going to cause uh, um, kind of be, be weaker and inflation to fall. Uh, the next one is inflationary. 
In other words, when I say printing of money, taking onto the balance sheet of the central bank those purchases and going out there and making the purchases of assets. They may be targeted, they may be achieved through guarantees, like in the last 2008 financial crisis, where they, we went to things uh, like, do you guarantee money market funds? Do you guarantee um, General Electric's commercial paper? Um, these types of guarantees, so, or um, actually printing of money, it could be a, a guarantee can work just as well as a as a actual purchase. But I mean, purchase is the Fed um, or the central bank uh, buys that financial asset, buys a particular financial asset. But in any case, what they do is they uh, they do print that money. They go buy financial assets and they take them onto their balance sheet, and then they start to control it well. And if that's done well, in a way where it's done in balance with um, the austerity and the debt restructuring, then you have a process in which you can restructure the debt and then begin again. And so those are the three. Or there's, of course, uh, redistribu redistributing the wealth, because redistributing the wealth can have an effect that if the debtor is in a bind, and you get money from someone else and you help them make the payments, that's a possibility, that's a possibility too. So a beautiful deleveraging is when that's done uh, very well. Okay, I want to distinguish then between inflationary depressions and related to currency crises um, because I think that's, there are deflationary depressions uh, and there are inflationary depressions. And so, uh, and again, the big thing is what's your debt denominated in, because that gives you the flexibility if you have the printing press. So countries with the worst debt problems, um, uh, a lot of debt denominated in a foreign currency, and a high dependence on foreign capital, typically have significant currency weaknesses. The currency weaknesses is what causes their inflation and um, has a capital flow because they don't have the ability to do exercise the, the beautiful deleveraging in the way that I described. And so when I look at it and I'm saying, okay, how's this, how's this debt crisis going to play out? I look, I have my checklist here and saying, does this apply? Does this, do these things apply? And then if, I, if these things apply, then I think it's more likely to be an inflationary um, uh, contraction. And so they, here they are. They don't have a reserve currency. They have low foreign exchange reserves. They have a large foreign debt. They have a large and increasing budget and or current account deficit. They, they keep the deficits and they have to monetize that. They have negative real rates. Interest rates are low in relationship to inflation. So what they're trying to do is take that which is their domestic debt and they're trying to monetize it. And then they have a history of high inflation and negative total returns uh, for their currency because um, that's the way they run their monetary policy. So now I want to bring you up to, up to speed in, in this um, and just show you again some of the parallels. This chart shows, uh, top chart shows, um, the debt, rel uh, private sector debt relative to GDP. And so there you go, and that goes back to 1900. And then below that, I show uh, both interest rates and um, the central bank's printing of, of money. So what you see is 1929, uh, 19, 1928-29, classic high debt, um, you see the blue line, interest rates hit zero. Um, you see the red line shows central bank prints money and buys financial assets. And so you could see that um, that also happened in 2008 and nine, um, a high debt uh, burden. You go down, the blue line hits zero, and then the large printing of financial assets. And you can see that that's the only two times that that's happened in, in that century because it is the same dynamic which reflects being late in the late in the long-term debt cycle. The absence of, this, of the ability of monetary policy to operate in 
same way. I say there are three types of monetary policy, what I call monetary policy one, two, and three. Monetary policy one is largely interest rates. Monetary policy two is uh, largely print money and buy financial assets. That becomes less and less effective, and then you get into what, what we call a liquidity trap, which is that you buy the financial assets, and that's great for all the people who have the financial assets, except they're all competing for financial assets, and, and, the, and as a result, not all those financial assets will have low returns, but they don't stimulate the economy in the same way, and that has, uh, and so you have the, what's called a liquidity trap, and that means that you have to have in some manner a coordination between fiscal and monetary policy to be able to uh, shift. By far the best investment.